today we'd like to announce five hazardous attitudes that are causing pilots to make bad decisions. The five hazardous attitudes are anti-authority, impulsivity, invulnerability, macho, and resignation. Those hazardous attitudes were introduced to aviation over 30 years ago, and they definitely still apply. However, a lot has changed. But going into 2024, we've got five new hazardous attitudes that are contributing to bad pilot decision making. Let's go ahead and get into the five new hazardous attitudes that are affecting pilots today. And at the end of this video, we'll pull all these five new hazardous attitudes into just one consolidated idea. All right, let's talk about these five new or current hazardous attitudes that are getting pilots in trouble. Number one, ignorant confidence. You just don't know what you don't know. Psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger introduced something in the late 90s called the Dunning-Kruger effect. What the Dunning-Kruger effect basically says is that individuals in the field, let's say aviation, sometimes have the most confidence, even though they don't have the competence. That especially applies to newer people in that field. Your low-time pilot sometimes thinks that they know everything about aviation, and they don't. The Dunning-Kruger effect is popularized within this graph, often referred to as the Mount Stupid graph. As you can see, the people with the least amount of experience have the perception that their competence is much higher than it really is. This is what's known as Mount Stupid. So in aviation, this first part of the graph really is your those first couple hundred hours where you just don't know everything, but you may think you know everything. There's a great book called The Killing Zone. Part of the book talks about this. Those first hundred hours are extremely dangerous to pilots. They just don't know what they don't know. After you get off Mount Stupid and you realize that there's so much more to learn, that creates a sharp drop in the person's confidence. That sharp drop of confidence takes you to the valley of despair. But once the pilot learns that there's more to learn and it's just part of the journey, they come out of that valley with growing confidence that is grounded in reality and experience. If we look at the actual chart from the Dunning-Kruger effect study, you'll see the same concept uh, as the Mount Stupid chart, but the presentation is not so widely inflated. But the concept is the same. The people with the least experience have the most confidence, but they don't have the competence. That's the, that's the danger area for pilots. This new hazardous attitude really can be measured with data. Statistics show accidents and incidents and number of hours that the pilot has. Low-time pilots have a greater chance of having an accident than high-time pilots. What's the countermeasure for this hazardous attitude? Well, it's stay humble, keep learning, and seek and accept feedback from others. That will help you protect you from this attitude. If you like this kind of content, I'd really appreciate it if you give a like and subscribe. Thanks a lot. Okay, the second new hazardous attitude revolves around fatigue, specifically decision fatigue. Hopefully we all know that fatigue is a real thing. You can't just have a cup of coffee and it'll be okay. The effects of fatigue are pretty well known. Impairment-like behaviors, uh, lowering your risk tolerances, and uh, degraded performance are really common for fatigued individuals. So how does fatigue happen? Usually it's through a combination of lack of sleep, um, extended uh, duration of uh, flying or workload, circadian phase irregularities, and extended wakefulness. They all contribute to fatigue. So this next hazardous condition then really isn't just about fatigue. It's about decision fatigue. When we're flying, we have to make hundreds, if not thousands of small decisions throughout a trip. And usually those decisions work out and you have a nice flight. However, making those sometimes small decisions while fatigued can be a real killer of pilots. The more decisions you make and the more fatigued you are, the higher likelihood that you're going to make a bad decision. That's why we really have to be aware of decision fatigue. With all the accident case studies that we see on YouTube and read about, it's pretty easy to tell, you know, that person was beyond tired, like fatigued. Like why would, why would anybody choose what they chose in that scenario? Pilots making these decisions that clearly they made because they were fatigued. So what happens when you're tired? Well, you may do things impulsively. You may avoid making a decision. You may encounter something like brain fog where points are just lining up. You may become irritable. You may become distracted. All these are signs that you're fatigued and your decision-making process is not going to be working as well as it should be. So what's the countermeasure for decision fatigue? Well, it seems obvious. Don't get fatigued. And how do you do that? You prioritize your sleep. 
you exercise, you eat healthy. And as pilots, we do things like we stick to our personal minimums so we don't get into a situation where we're making decisions while we're extremely tired. The other thing you can do is get help, right? Get help from another pilot, a coach, a friend, a mentor, or if you're in the air, get help from ATC. Whatever it takes to help you make a good decision when you're fatigued. The third hazardous attitude for 2024 revolves around screen time and automation. Now, I love my iPad and I love an autopilot. And I think if you have either one of those things, it definitely increases safety in the air. However, over-reliance on either of those types of automation can cause problems. As an instructor, I see this manifest itself in a couple of different ways. The first is people don't look outside. They become so fixated on their iPad or their glass cockpit that they don't look outside enough. Again, I'm a big fan of the iPad and ForeFlight and all the tools that give us the situational awareness and safety, but we do need to look outside and be able to fly the airplane. On the autopilot front, not understanding the automation can really harm a pilot. You should know how to use it, how to diagnose an issue, and most importantly, you should know how to fly the airplane if the autopilot fails you. There have been far too many accidents where the autopilot was indicating an error and the pilot or pilots whether that be a GA pilot all the way up to airline pilots, ended up causing an accident and killing themselves or others because they were so focused on getting that autopilot fixed that they crashed the airplane. I personally have seen that an over-reliance of an autopilot really degrades the stick and rudder skills needed by many pilots. If you have an autopilot, absolutely use it. I love it. But remember, it's not all about just hitting the AP button. You need to know how to fly the airplane. Another example, when you file a flight plan with ATC, Flight will send you back what the recommended route is or what you, it's, you're likely to get. And pilots will just blindly accept that because that's just what they're going to get. But you don't have to do that. You should talk to ground or tower to tell them what you actually want. A perfect scenario of this was I was flying from the northeast back down to the southeast part of the country. And the flight plan that was given back to me was going to take me over the mountains in freezing condition. I didn't want to do that. So I just talked to ground and I said, here's what I'd rather do. And they just simply made the change for me in the system. That kept me out of freezing conditions and away from mountainous territory. So the countermeasure for both of these really is maintain your stick and rudder skills by looking outside and flying the airplane. Key to success on this is to look outside. Maybe go out with a friend or a safety pilot or an instructor. Maybe put your iPad down and practice things like spotting traffic or roads or towns or other airports. Keeping those skills sharp is important as well. And on the autopilot front, yeah, turn off the autopilot and fly m more to maintain those stick and rudder skills. The other countermeasure for the autopilot is know everything about it. Hi, and uh, this is 7 Charlie Bravo. Uh, we're having some issues with our controls, and uh, I'd like to uh, declare an emergency at this time. Uh, we don't need any of the emergency uh, services. The autopilot just uh, went out of whack on us for one Charlie Bravo. Know all the ins and outs, and don't go up there guessing. The fourth hazardous attitude for 2024 is relaxed discipline. Oftentimes, I see, and I know others see, you go to your check ride, you get your private pilot certificate or your commercial pilot certificate, instrument rating, whatever, and your skills are pretty good, and then you don't fly, and you don't practice, and those skills decline. The other thing that people do as those skills decline is they lose the discipline that they were taught or should have been taught during their training. This shows itself in ways like just entering a non-towered airport straight in instead of going through the process and proper procedure to enter the traffic pattern in the right way. That has caused accident after accident. Everybody, please be advised there is an accident towards uh, runway 20. Please be advised, Watsonville. NorCal inquired about a possible accident at Watsonville. And here's the exchange that they had, which describes the accident well. Do you hear anything on uh, CTAF? We heard there was a the crash at Watsonville just now at Twin Cessna. Yeah, the uh, Twin Cessna was on a long final approach, and somebody else was on base turning final. And uh, the final approach, the twin engine Cessna didn't see him, and uh, he crashed into him. The, twin, the single engine Cessna went down, and the twin engine uh, rolled into the ground. Uh, last ridge rule descent for a straight in for 20 Watsonville. Watsonville area traffic, twin Cessna 740, which could you at three miles straight in, 20, full stop, Watsonville. Uh, Watsonville traffic, Cessna 931, in left base, 20, Watsonville. 
Boston Area traffic, twin sets of 740 Whiskey Juliet, one mile uh, straight in, two zero, full stop. Looking for traffic on left base. Yeah, I see you. You're, uh, you're behind me. I'm going to go around then because you're coming at me pretty quick, man. It's that attitude of, well, it's good enough or who really cares. That's what gets pilots in trouble and causes issues. The other thing that pilots do after they pass their check ride, if they, they don't pursue any type of advanced or other training. They get their flight review every two years, they check the box, and they, that's all they do. And yes, that's the minimum, like that's what you have to do. However, to be a safer pilot, you should be challenging yourself, you know, trying for new certificates or ratings or uh, endorsements like a tailwheel or high performance, things like that, to enhance your piloting skills. Good enough in aviation just isn't good enough. So that's the countermeasure. Keep training, keep learning, keep experiencing new things in flying. Okay, the last hazardous attitude I'm calling medical masking. It's pretty pervasive, at least here in the U.S., that pilots are not so inclined to share all of their medical information with their AME or the FAA. The reason for this is traditionally the lack of tolerance by the FAA in giving medicals to people with potential issues. It could take months or even years to get a medical issue recognized, diagnosed, and approved by the FAA. So that has led a lot of pilots to just not disclose what's going on with them. There was a news article recently that said there's 5,000 pilots flying around in the national airspace system with undisclosed medical issues. That's probably a little sensational. However, there are a lot of pilots probably flying around with undisclosed medical issues. So what do you do about this? First, you should establish a relationship with the with a medical examiner. That's so much better to have some sort of relationship with AME instead of just showing up to some random AME. If there's no opportunity for coaching beforehand, then that could lead to a medical deferral that could take you weeks, months, or years to resolve. It's also a great idea to get a medical advocate as well. The National Association of Flight Instructors More Right Rudder podcast had a episode just on this very topic. I'll post that in the description below. The other thing you can do is push your FISDO, the FAA, even your lawmakers to encourage the FAA to be more tolerant of medical concerns. Another part of the medical masking really re revolves around mental health. The FAA says they are committed to addressing mild mental health concerns with the pilots, and we'd love to see that continue. Other countries in the world are taking a more proactive approach to this, and I'm glad to see that the FAA is listening to the pilot community and addressing these mental health challenges. So medical masking is a real thing. So what do you do about this? If you have an issue, please talk to someone about it so it's not a safety of flight issue for yourself or others. So we got through five new hazardous attitudes for 2024, and I hope they raise some awareness to the real challenges that pilots are facing today. Those five hazardous attitudes that we talked about for 2024, plus the five older ones, they all boil down to one thing, decision-making, and really bad decision-making. Please, always keep learning, seek help and guidance, and while we're on the topic of health, I did make a video about some very simple but powerful things pilots can do to stay safe while in the air. I'll put a link to that here, and fly safe, everyone.